Uh, Stu Thomas, welcome to Australian Musician. How are you, Greg? Thanks oh, for having me. So how's your, your 2020 been? Uh, what, what did you have in store before the uh, COVID hit? Well, let's see. It's been about six months since I, my last gig. Um, I had quite a few sort of lined up with my band. I was going to launch my new album and uh, uh, all kinds of stuff with, the, with Kim Salmon and Dave Graney. All got shelved. Who else? Rebecca Barnard gigs. Anyway, um, so the last gig I did was March the 3rd. Uh, sorry, March the 9th. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I've been keeping busy doing online gigs, uh, solo gigs on stage at that platform uh, where you buy a ticket and you see, see an artist. I've done everything from Iggy Pop to Bowie and a couple of my albums. And uh, last week, Lee Hazelwood. So uh, I've got to come up with something new <laughs> next time. But um, uh, yeah, just uh, keeping busy doing a bit of art, a bit of music, practicing a lot of guitar. I've done a few online sessions for people like Shane Amara and other people. Um, so things are bubbling away, but just a little slower than I'm used to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you have managed to get an album out, Counting to Infinity, with this two Thomas Paradox. Um, yeah. I believe your band began recording that in about 2018. It's, it's been coming for a while. Well, it's been coming longer than that. But, yeah, when we actually started do, doing something about uh, the recording it was 2018. Um, well, it, actually, it was recorded in two sessions. The first session was two hours long. And we did um, four songs. And then the, the other session in 2019 was two hours long and we did five songs. And the reason being is that people are very busy in my band. <laughs> I've got... Um, Billy Miller, Eddie Miller, and Phil Collings, and they're all they're all in in high demand, and they teach music and they play in lots of bands, so to get them in one place for two hours was um, quite quite the feat. And uh, so when I had that all recorded, so we didn't have much to sort of work with. We had one one takes of all the songs. I don't think even the Beatles did that for their first album, <laughs> but uh, you've got. Um, I, I got I had the time to do the rest of it at home, so I um, did that and I took it back into Sound Park and we flew flew it in, as you say, and and then I did the vocals, and that's what completed the rest. Um, and I was waiting and looking for a long time for a label to to put it out, and off the hip records finally did, so I'm happy with that. Yeah. So how do the how do the arrangements for the songs come together? Do you just play uh, the songs to the band and you jam them out or is it more sophisticated than that? Um, well, most of the songs on this album, or well, some of them are, are covers and um, we I always have an idea about doing them a different way anyway. And they're from films, all of them. So that's, that's another point of difference for us. Um, we don't really just do covers of songs we like. We, we have to be from films. Don't ask me why. It's just, it's just. I thought it was a good thing to do. And there's plenty of really good songs in in movies, past and present. Anyway, um, so yeah. To come back to your question, I think what what happens is I, I find I find an angle on the song, even if it's my own, and uh, with the band in mind, of course, because uh, it's no use trying to sort of do a synth pop thing because we don't have a synth. So. It's always going to be guitar based, but I don't, I don't really uh, direct my band, but they seem to read my mind quite a lot. And uh, in, in some ways, all I do is, is provide an atmosphere in, in words and I find that works much better. And then we just, we flesh out the, the thing ourselves with our own sort of uh, input and, and experience. So it's very rare that I tell anyone to play anything. So everything that you've heard, heard on this album, everyone's done themselves. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a pretty uh, great band. <laughs> tell me about some of the films that you've taken songs from for this album. Okay. Let me have a quick squiz at it. <laughs> oh, there it is. Um, 
All right, yeah, the first one is the girl, uh, girl on Death Row's uh, Lee Hazelwood song. I've got a bit of a penchant for Lee. Um, I think that's because my mum had a lot of his, uh, well, Nancy Sinatra records, and I just loved his voice. Grew up singing like that. And, and as a, as a grown-up, I uh, have a bit of a low voice. So um, it suits me, and I, I've taken that song from, uh, it's from Why Must I Die, which is a movie from 1960. And um, it's pretty B, B grade, maybe B minus. And uh, <laughs> it features in, in the opening credits, I think, or maybe the closing ones. And it's credited to uh, Dwayne Eddy and his orchestra, funnily enough, but Lee sings the song. Um, so just quickly, some of the other films are Thunderball. So I'm doing this, the uh, soundtrack, uh, the uh, title track. And uh, that's Tom Jones, who I really love as a singer. I couldn't really do Tom. I just had to do myself. Um, and we've got Johnny Guitar, which I think this is, it's almost a standard well, that's almost a standard cover in itself, or it used to be. Every band used to do that in the 60s, lots of surf bands, for example. And, and, but that's by Peggy Lee, and, and uh, that's from the movie Johnny Guitar. And the other one is uh, called Satan, from a movie called Satan Sadists, which is a, another Z, Z-grade movie. And uh, it's just a biker movie, pretty, pretty trashy, pretty unwatchable. Uh, but that's a great opening number as well <laughs> yeah um the final note that you sing in thunderball uh is a mighty effort uh, how many cracks did you have at that <laughs> well a few and then the, the one that that made it through i um was virtually um unconscious for i don't know if you've ever had this uh, <laughs> this experience of singing or playing on stage, Greg, where you uh, hit a note that it's, uh, takes it out of you and uh, you stop seeing anything. Um, I think it's called blacking out. And then, uh, yeah, but it, and then I just, uh, when I came to, I asked him if he'd recorded it. And uh, this is Edge from Sound Park. And he said, yeah, we got it. So, uh, yeah, it did take a while. I, I was surprised. So I used to... Um, knock that one off uh, we've been playing these songs for years and i used to play, uh, sing it a lot better <laughs> five years ago i think but uh, as you get older your voice you know goes lower apparently you ask robert plant you know he'll tell you um but uh yeah so we got it <laughs> yeah. um i was looking at the the band camp bio uh and in the credits for the album uh you credited with some whistling Although, although I couldn't detect whistling on any of the, the song. Oh. But, um, um, on Mama's Boy, it's just on one song. Oh, okay. Um, whistling's a kind of uh, lost art. Um, who, who are the, some of the famous whistlers that you uh, are fond of? Well, obviously you've got, um, I don't know who the person was doing it, but the kind of music that Ennio Morricone was doing for a while, you know, obviously the good, the bad and the ugly, I think we're talking. Hang them high or, or those uh, spaghetti westerns is what I'm talking about. It's the most famous whistling. Um, I don't know, have you ever seen the Ennio Morricone experience? They're a Melbourne band. Yeah. They used to cover Ennio. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, they're great whistlers. Um, yeah, what else is there? I guess the guy... <laughs> There was a great whistling part in um, Eric the Half B, which is a, a Monty Python song. Incredible whistling. <laughs> yeah, there's quite a few sort of soundtracky things, I think, but I, the names escape me of, of them now. Yeah. But yeah, there used to be a thing, didn't it? Like in, in the 60s, 70s, especially. Yeah. I think, is so, it uh, Bing Crosby? Was he a whistler? Probably. You look like one. Yeah. One of those guys. <laughs> While he was golfing, he was whistling, surely. Yeah. Yeah. So there are one or two tracks that you're particularly happy about the way they came out on the album? Oh, yeah. Look, I really like um, my original songs. <laughs> the Ticket, the first song, and um, Rebuild My Head, I'm particularly happy. Oh, and, and Revelations, the last song, with the lyrics. The, the lyrics, I think, are... Um, I really um, got them together. It, sometimes it took years, like uh, Rebuild My Head was 
started in the 90s and then and then in the 2000s i got another verse and then in 2010s i finished it off so it takes i mean i left the song behind basically and then then you 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 find something in it and you sort of um take it somewhere but um other songs like revelations fell out in one one hit and i was pretty happy with that ticket as well i used to i used to walk around a lot when i didn't have a car in in, in the day and um with a little guitar and I'd walk to one mate's house or another, you know, in the wee hours. And by the time I got home, I had this song and quickly put it down on four track. And, um, yeah, just the words all came at once. So it's very rare that happens. But, um, yeah, that, that, that's the reason I like um, those songs. But um, the other reason is, um, oh, the playing, like uh, Phil Collins drumming is incredible and, and Billy Miller's playing. And he does a lot of Ebo and um, you don't hear a lot of good Ebo <laughs> or any really. So I'm uh, pretty happy we captured it. And it's one of the unique things about, uh, you know, the soloing on the album. It's really, it's really singing guitar and uh, only Billy can do that. I, I can't even hold the thing, so yeah. let alone play it. So he's, Billy's providing the, the fuzz tone on Ticket? I'm I'm um, I'm playing my uh, my uh, Burns Burns uh, guitar. I'll show it to you if you want. Yeah. Um, this is what this is the guitar I played on on all of it. Um, okay. Burns um, Marquee Club Series um, from 2003. I think it's Korean model when when they were still um, made by um, um, Korea, but. Um, they weren't very popular, so I got that incredibly cheap. And um, a few years later, they went back to London to make uh, to make them. But I just really like it. It's it's not quite a Stratocaster. It's got its own thing going on. And the fuzz tone was me. My, all the fuzz tones on the album are me, except for the, the singing the singing guitars, uh, Billy. Um, and I don't have it with me, but I don't know if you've heard of a fuzz face uh, that I used that for. Um, for my fuzz tone, it was at the studio, so I borrowed that pretty nice vintage pedal, but huge, like it is the size of a face, unnecessary. Sounds great. <laughs> yeah. And of what amps were you playing through? Um, well, I only, I only played through a little Fender uh, Pro Junior. That's my preferred amp, little amps. I, one, I can't carry them around, my, my back would break. And two, it just sounds great. It's the smallest of the fenders you can have uh, valves with and it's got a great sound. You can just push it. But uh, yeah, it's this little beauty here on top. That's the Pro Junior. But um, when I did my overdub guitar bits, I um, did at home, I set up this system of putting the Pro Junior through uh, a little Samic guitar that I had. So we've got, uh, and then I recorded them both and separately. <laughs> so we've got all that in the recording and it's a, uh, I think it's a nice sound, you know, it gives it something a bit uh, biteier because, um, because the Pro Junior has only got um, um, a vol volume tr uh, and a treble. That's it, there's, there's no other um, <laughs> ways of getting uh, intonation, so. I either had to get a graphic equaliser pedal instead of that, I <laughs> put it through another amp, you know, which is I always thought might be a good idea, but it actually worked. Mm. Um, yeah, and that's uh, yeah, that's my guitar sounds. The only other guitar I used was the baritone guitar, um, um, also by Burns, and it looks exactly like the other one. Um, it's longer, of course, uh, and that's a Barracuda by Burns, uh, and I think that's about 20, 2003 as well, or 2007. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, I had to use that for Girl on Death Row because, you know, Dwayne Eddy and all that. <laughs> um, I noticed you were playing a, a, a gorgeous sounding Maiden on the weekend on your Lee Hazelwood uh, uh, broadcast. Um, is there any uh, story behind the acquisition of the Maiden? Oh, the mate, yeah, I've been uh, wanting to get a good acoustic for many years. I've never had one. And 
I was looking around for ages and I, I realised I really liked the Maiden sound, but I didn't want um, I didn't want to cut away the typical sort of sound. I, I found that the the um, uh, the light the light looking ones uh, I don't know what the woods called, but probably Sitka or something like that, and um, just too bright for my my ears. So I was waiting and f waiting on some sort of invention, and they were talking about putting out blackwood guitars and uh, made of Victorian or Tasmanian blackwood. Anyway, not only do they look good, but they have a sort of mellower sound, and that suits me better because, well. I'm more of my my intonation of of choice is is some more bass leaning. So I I found that they had a I tried a few of them and uh, they had a more sort of uh, yeah not not to, not thin and and not so bright sound and I could hit them harder and and uh, which I tend to do. So I waited and. Um, was looking for a jumbo version and it took ages for them to come out with that and uh, that's what I got. So yeah, I'm pretty pleased with the old um, Blackwood jumbo. It's a beautiful guitar. It makes everything sound really good and it's, you know, it's electric acoustic as well. So that was um, a really good find and I'm glad I waited all this time. Um, but uh, I don't think many people are a, like the Blackwoods and the Jumbos, <laughs> you don't see them around much. So, yeah. Yeah. Then, then the other the other final guitar I want to tell you about for the album is, um, it's just uh, the, the Fender Precision Bass. It's pretty standard. I think this is from 1981. I've had it for a few years now. Yeah. But that's what I use for the Surrealists and Dave Graining. And, but... Eddie uses it for Stu Thomas Paradox. So that's the other sound we have. I think it's really part of our sound. The yeah. Burns and the Fender mixture, anyway. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Kim Salmon. Uh, you guys have also got a new album out, Rantings from the Book of Swamp. Um, yeah. what's, the best thing, what's the best thing about playing with Kim Salmon and the Surrealists? Oh, yeah, the best thing is... Uh, making up things and not having to worry about it. Um, so, you know, this, I don't know if you know the story behind this new album is, uh, it's a recording of a live stream we did in June and uh, uh, it was broadcast and recorded in a studio uh, and, and then it was mastered and it wasn't, wasn't edited or overdubbed in any way. And we virtually didn't know anything about these songs. We, we had sketches that we brought each of the band members, so three of us, we brought to the sessions and then we bravely um, started the song. And, and they're pretty lengthy because we, we weren't really sure where they were going to go. That's why it's a double album, I suppose. Um, and Kim, on the way through, was reading out to... Uh, no, uh, words he'd randomly written in his book called uh, Rantings from the Book of Swamp. And, uh, and there you have sort of songs. Uh, and um, it kind of, you need some words to sort of uh, frame, frame this music. Otherwise, it could get really proggy, I suppose. But um, what I really like, yeah, I really enjoy playing with Kim. He's always got good ideas. We sort of bounce off each other. We, we think completely different uh, things about music sometimes, but it's a good thing. Yeah. You played with uh, a lot of different artists. What are the elements that have to be present for you to take on a project? Oh, okay, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I don't take things on until I've heard what they're doing and had a big think. And um, if there's something in the, the style I like, and then I'll go with it. I mean, they have to, they have to probably be a certain level now um, uh, of, of musicianship. And, and I, I mean, in the past, I probably would have played with anyone when I was uh, starting up. But uh, there's so many good players there that there's no need to sort of uh, me to jump at everything. But, um, yeah, I guess I look for... Um, Something in the, I like a lot of styles of music, so it's pretty open, but I mean, a certain quality in it. 
if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's something that's sort of a bit unique, otherwise I don't really want to be involved. <laughs> yeah. You've done a lot of recording sessions. Uh, if you could go back in time and be at any recording session in history, which one would it be? <laughs> yeah, that's good, good questions. I think some of the Miles Davis ones, uh, just to see how they were done, like um, Bitches Brew and, and um, albums like that were, were recorded, they were improvised and then, and then chopped up later uh, and, and sort of assembled. And, um, but in, before the assembly, there was lots of playing and lots and lots of it and also how do you decide what was going to be in it? You know, probably probably was it decided because of the length of the record at the time but I mean, now you don't have that worry but um you know yes yeah, that's a good one uh, uh, maybe bitches brew on the corner or something like that um i don't know i was thinking about this the other day i was listening to something i thought oh that would have been great to have been there it was a singer i think um serge gainsborg or something just to see what it was like on certainly sort of Bowie, Bowie records like um, Heroes to see the experimental nature of it all. Like Robert Fripp, um, you know, getting tones out of his amp and walking walking on the floor with this sort of a fretboard sort of written on the floor for all the tones and you know things things like that. Were they did that actually happen? They must have because it's it's on the record, but you know. Brian, you know, imagine that, yeah, all those kind of things. There's so many, man. Yeah, what can you say? <laughs> uh, counting to infinity is out now. Um, if people want to uh, purchase the album and have a listen, what's the best place to go? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah counting to infinity. It's on. Uh, I've got CDs only at the moment at Bandcamp, um, and uh, later on in early in the year, I think we will go digital with that and you know any other format if if the if the funds are available but yeah cd you know buy direct from the artist me or um just go to this g thomas paradox band camp or um off the hit records are selling them as well so you know i think they're still functioning as much, as far as they can <laughs> so what are your revised plans for 2020 uh, let's see well, I just had news. I mean, because of those uh, restrictions and this uh, this road out of, of uh, Melbourne restrictions, uh, stupidly, I'd, I'd already booked. I had gigs booked or been asked to do gigs way into November, but they all they don't fit in, so we've had to cancel. It. So another five gigs down, uh, been sort of pushed aside. So. I, I decided not to worry about making any bookings um, and um, just what I really want to do is, is um, grab all these half finished songs that I've got and they keep popping up in my mind, songs from when I was 13 and so on, which I reckon I could actually finish now and be interesting to see um, what I'd do with them and uh, I want to put different kinds of instrumentation in. Uh, I play brass as well, so I wouldn't mind trying a bit of that. and. Um, and do more art. I might do an online art exhibition next, as actually, yeah. So there's a couple of things that keep me busy. <laughs> All right, Stuart Thomas, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, cheers.